Thanks for the oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Welcome back to those of you that have been here, and welcome to our newcomers. Um, I'm Sherry Lee. I'm with Architecture for Humanity. I'm Director of Strategic Development, and we're moving into our active spaces design to move panel. Feels like the right kind of day for that. We should start off with jumping jacks or something. Um, so we have a fantastic panel here, an unbelievable moderator um, from New York. I'll let you. I'll let her tell you more about herself. But thank you for coming, and we'll start with the panel, and then we'll have Q and A afterwards in this space right behind us. So. Okay. Thank you, Sherry. <coughs> Hi there. So uh, my name is Dr. Karen Lee, and I actually um, live in New York City. For the last eight years, um, I'm trained actually as a physician, but for the last eight years, my job has been to work with architects and designers and urban planners and real estate developers to basically integrate health issues into how they design. Um, and so I'm just going to start, I think, with a few intro slides of why this is so important, both relevant in the past and also relevant now uh, in the current. And then, you know, we'll have, uh, I'll introduce our distinguished panelists, and we've got a fantastic panel today. And, you know, they're gonna actually share with us um, what some of the solutions are uh, to address, I think, the current health epidemics that we're faced with um, today. And we're talking about health epidemics that are occurring not only in the United States, but actually increasingly globally in our world. So. The key roles of community and building design in protecting and promoting health as a part of designing for impact. Um, this is a slide about our history, right? Um, in the developed world, in most of our cities, uh, in the 19th century and early 20th century, infectious diseases like cholera, yellow fever, tuberculosis, those were the leading causes of death. And the way that we actually defeated those diseases was through infrastructure, design, and planning. We used our city infrastructures. We created sanitation systems, sewer systems, water systems. We designed buildings that had windows for light and air. We set back our buildings sufficiently that, you know, <coughs> damp puddles that uh, used to breed mosquitoes would dry up and, and no longer breed those mosquitoes and cause things like yellow fever. And that was actually how we defeated many of these diseases. Uh, 1940. Um, for example, uh, in New York City, these diseases had been defeated, largely defeated, dropped to something like 11% of deaths from 60% of deaths in the 1800s. And that was prior to the advent of most of our major antibiotics. Penicillin not discovered until 1939, not in widespread use in 1940. So design and infrastructure has always played a very key role in health issues. Today, we've got a different set of diseases, chronic diseases, and in fact, many of these diseases known as chronic diseases, heart disease and strokes, diabetes, cancers, we can actually think of them as diseases of energy because 
key issues related to these diseases are physical inactivity and unhealthy diets. And unhealthy diets really often are about eating too many calories that are nutrient empty, right? And when we're physically inactive, usually it requires us to move ourselves in other ways, right? using petrochemical fuels, using electricity. And so they're actually very nice and important synergies with environmentally sustainable design. So as I said, major epidemics of today are non-infectious diseases, chronic diseases, heart disease and strokes, now the leading causes of death in the world. Um, even in the developing world, they've overtaken infectious diseases. Uh, 36 million deaths per year from chronic diseases, uh, according to the World Health Organization. And 80% of these deaths are accounted for uh, by preventable risk factors. Tobacco use, physical inactivity, unhealthy diets, harmful use of alcohol. Um, I just want to show you some slides of some of these epidemics occurring. So for example, in the United States. Uh, 1985, this is the epidemic of obesity. I'm sure all of you have heard about that in, in the news media. Uh, this was when the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention began collecting data. So they did surveys. They started doing surveys of populations across the U.S. states, and they would ask people about their health behaviors. They would also ask them about their weights and their heights, and they would use the ratio of their weights to heights to calculate something called body mass index, which is BMI. A BMI of 30 or above is considered obese in adults. And um, I want you to keep in mind as you see these slides that um, when people self-report their heights and weights, men tend to over-report their heights, women tend to under-report their weights, and so this actually is a representation, this representation that you're going to see is actually an under-report um, of, of, the, of the problem, of the, of the prevalence of obesity, right? Anyways, we'll click through these slides very quickly. By 1990, most states have data. You could see no state above 14% obesity in adults. And it changes starting in the early 1990s. By 1997, a uh, new color, above 20%. The majority of states now above 15%. And it just doesn't stop. All right? So we're at 2009 now multiple states above 25%. Colorado's trailing at 15 to 19%. By 2010, they've now tipped also into the above 20%. Multiple states above 30%. Um, at the same time that all of this is happening, thank goodness, right? The researchers out there in planning, in architecture, and in, in um, design, in health, are doing research and looking at, you know, can the design of our buildings, our streets, our neighborhoods actually make a difference to these issues? And indeed, the evidence is now in. There is now ample evidence that how we design our buildings, streets, neighborhoods, and their amenities very much shape issues like physical activity. And also increasingly, we're seeing evidence that it shapes healthy eating. So designing to increase active transportation by walkable neighborhoods, neighborhoods that actually have bicycling amenities, that are connected to destinations through these active and sustainable modes. Even transit, you know, which usually starts or ends with a walk, or a bicycle trip if you have um, connectivity between different modes. Um, designing to increase active transportation can increase regular physical activity in the population by 35 to 160%. New York City, actually, it has the life expectancy is actually rising at a rate faster than the rest of the United States. It has a rate of physical activity and people meeting physical activity recommendations at nearly three times that of the rest of the United States. This is occurring primarily through active transportation, right? And so designing for activity in daily life through the things that we do as we live life is actually really, really critical. Designing to increase active recreation um, for people in leisure time, both adults and kids, really important in helping to control weights and increasing activity levels. And even how we design our buildings, um, you know, to promote, for example, stair use amongst people who are able-bodied uh, is really important. And you know, I just want to end by saying that by designing for health, we actually are also designing for multiple co-benefits. So I talked about the environment at the beginning of the presentation, right? We know that if you're if you have walkable, cyclable neighborhoods, those are also sustainable modes of transport that will improve air quality, that will address issues like um, um, our carbon footprint, even stairs rather than elevators and escalators, right? I saw a statistic that said an escalator running 24-7 can generate something like four carloads of carbon dioxide per year. 
So in very vertical built, um, um, cities, that is actually not insignificant. Active recreation rather than television. Television associated with obesity in children, right? Uh, particularly in children. And you know, from an inactivity point of view, from eating during watching television and from exposure to food advertising. At the same time, if we can actually move children and families out to play, that can actually really help. Um, and TVs in a place like New York State anticipated very soon overtake refrigerators as the main source of household appliance energy use. Right? And then also on the uh, food front, right? uh, whether you're drinking bottled water or bottled and canned beverages that are highly caloric, they're going into the landfill, those bottles and those cans. And you know, if you think about eating food, fresh, healthy food, often comes with very little waste and waste that's compostable, right? Think about all of the junk foods that are out there, whether you buy them at the grocery store or you buy them in a fast food restaurant. They're highly packaged, they're highly processed, all the transportation miles, all that goes into the landfill. Um, accessibility issues, right? Many of our communities are aging and the most walkable urban realms are usually the ones most accessible by people as they age and walkers, people in wheelchairs. Um, it, uh, and even in buildings, right, where stair use is promoted, um, elevators uh, are freed up, really, for people who actually need them. Uh, and then, you know, other things like infrastructure costs, cost to communities, um, reduced by more walkable compact patterns. Uh, people want this now, National Association of Realtors, right? actually did a survey, uh, they do surveys every year of the American population and they're finding that the majority of Americans now prefer smart growth communities. This is occurring also in Canada, in Australia, in the surveys that are being done. So with that, you know, and with uh, the need now to address these issues and to actually um, potentially affect multiple co-beneficial outcomes through how we design. We're going to uh, we're going to have our panel come up and talk about what they're doing, um, and then we're going to have more discussion with you guys and with them. So let me introduce our distinguished panel. Uh, first is Dr. Dean Ornish. Dr. Dean Ornish basically is uh, founder and president of the Preventive Medicine Research Institute and is clinical professor of medicine at the University of California in San Francisco. Dr. Ornish, for the last 36 years, has been directing clinical research that demonstrates for the first time that comprehensive lifestyle changes can begin to reverse even very severe coronary artery disease without drugs and without surgery. Recently, Medicare agreed to provide coverage for this program, the first time that Medicare has ever covered a program of comprehensive lifestyle changes. He's directed the first randomized controlled trial demonstrating that comprehensive lifestyle changes can stop and even reverse the progression of early stage prostate cancer. His current research is showing that comprehensive lifestyle changes affect gene, gene expression, the turning on of disease causing genes or the turning off of genes that, uh, oh, turning on of disease preventing genes and the turning off of genes that can promote diseases like cancer and heart disease. Um, he's the author of six books, all national bestsellers. Uh, his research uh, has been published widely in many medical journals, including Journal of the American Medical Association, New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, and he's been appointed by President Clinton to the White House Commission on Complementary and Alternative Medicine Policy, and is currently appointed by President Obama to the White House Advisory Group on Prevention, Health Promotion, Integrative and Public Health. So Dr. Ornish will be our first speaker. Our second speaker is Jean Noodleman. Jean is the Director of Community Benefit Programs and National Lead, Community Health, um, National Lead for Community Health Needs Assessment for Kaiser Permanente. Jean is responsible for leading Kaiser Permanente's efforts to enhance the health of communities through Northern, throughout Northern California through charitable contributions and partnerships. Jean is responsible for the region's contributions program, which has provided over $20 million in regional grants to community partners uh, in 2012. Jean is responsible for Kaiser's regional um, strategic grants program, uh, including community health initiatives and outreach efforts. She has an MPH from UC Berkeley in planning and policy and has worked in the Bay Area for public health departments in planning and prevention before joining Kaiser Permanente in 1992. Uh, then we have um, also, um, bear with me for a second. 
We have Jillian Gillette, and Jillian comes uh, to us from San Francisco, Director of Transportation Policy in the office of Mayor Edwin Lee. Uh, Jillian um, has been in the office uh, for some time now, but prior to joining the city, she ran a software consulting company specializing in business process modeling and workflow and focusing on the financial services sector. She moved to the Bay Area in 1998 during the dot-com boom. And to round out the panel, um, last but not least, Daryl Hammond, who is founder and CEO of Kaboom, which is a not-for-profit based in Washington, D.C., that's dedicated to giving all kids the active play that they need to become healthy and successful adults. Hammond wrote the successful bestseller, Kaboom, A Movement to Save Play, uh, which is a New York Times bestseller. Uh, Kaboom has raised over $250 million, rallied over a million volunteers, led the hands-on construction of 2,400 playgrounds. Uh, Daryl has won numerous uh, awards and honors and lives in Washington, D.C. with his wife, Kate Becker. So with that, I'll ask our panelists to come up and share with us their, um, their ideas, their thoughts, the things that they've been doing, and then we'll go into discussion. Test one, two. Great. So thanks. Thank you, Karen, for that very inspiring uh, introduction. Let's see. Let me just keep the time so I don't go over time. Great. So as Karen indicated, I, I'm um, passionate about how lifestyle changes can not only prevent but even reverse the most common chronic diseases. And uh, we're kind of approaching this on this panel from two directions. One is how can we create and design environments that make it easier for people to make healthy changes? And the other is what's the point of doing it? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about why these things are worth doing and then it makes sense to why we should design in ways that make that easier for people to make healthier choices. You know, we tend to think of advances in medicine as being a new drug, a new laser, something really uh, high tech and expensive. And we often have a hard time believing that the, the simple choices that we make in our lives each day, like what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, whether or not we smoke cigarettes, and perhaps most important, how much love and intimacy that we have, that these simple changes can make such a powerful difference, but they do. And what we've done in our re research over the last 36 years is to use the latest in high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific technologies to prove how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions can be. And as Karen indicated, we were able to show for the first time that even severe heart disease can actually be reversed in a matter of a few weeks by making these changes. And they are what we eat, uh, pre pre predominantly a, a whole foods plant-based diet, how we respond to stress using simple techniques like yoga and meditation, how much exercise we get just walking a half an hour a day, and how much love and social support we have. Now, it's not like there's one intervention for your heart and a different one for prostate cancer, your genes, or your diabetes, or whatever. It's the same intervention for all of them. And one of the interesting findings was that the more people change, the more they improved in every way we can measure. And that's exciting because uh, these biological mechanisms are so dynamic. What we find is that people feel so much better so quickly when they make these changes, it reframes the reason for making them from fear of dying, which is not sustainable, to joy of living, which is. You know, you think more clearly, you have more energy, you need less sleep, you have better sex, you feel better, uh, your joint pains go away. If you have heart disease, we found a, a greater than 96% reduction in the frequency of angina or chest pain without surgery, without drugs. We also found that we could reverse the progression of early stage prostate cancer and by extension breast cancer. We were the first to prove that. We can reverse type 2 diabetes at a time when a third of Americans are already diabetic or pre-diabetic and it'll be half of Americans in the next six or seven years at a cost of over $3.3 trillion. It's not sustainable. As Karen mentioned, we found that you can actually change your genes, that when you change your lifestyle, over 500 genes are changed in just three months. In effect, turning on the good genes that protect us turning off the genes that promote heart disease, prostate cancer, diabetes, and other conditions like that. We also found, we did a study with Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine four years ago for discovering her discovery of telomerase, which is an enzyme that repairs and lengthens our telomeres, the ends of our chromosomes that control how long we live. And she found that women who are under chronic emotional stress, their telomeres got shorter, which effectively shortened their lifespan by nine to 13 years. But we found, we just published last, or two months ago now, the first study showing we could actually not only increase telomerase, but actually in lengthen telomeres 
by about 10%, which is you know, adding another 10 years or so to your life, whereas they got shorter in the control group. It was the first study showing that anything could actually lengthen your telomeres. And based on these findings, as Karen indicated, me Medicare is now covering our program. So we can create a new paradigm of real health care instead of sick care at a time when there's a convergence of forces that really make this the right idea at the right time. For one thing, the limitations of high-tech medicine are becoming clear. You know, we spent almost $100 billion last year on bypass surgery and angioplasty, and yet the studies are showing that they don't work. They don't prolong life. They don't prevent heart attacks. They don't even reduce chest pain unless you're in the middle of having one, which most people aren't. Uh, the same is true for prostate cancer. One out of 49 men benefits from the treatments. The other 48 tend to become either impotent or incontinent or both. And the drugs that lower blood sugar for type 2 diabetes don't work nearly as well as lowering it through diet and lifestyle. If you can get someone's blood sugar down through diet and lifestyle, as we've shown, you can prevent all the human costs and all the economic costs. And the only side effects are good ones. And so, but what I like most about this is that it's an excuse, it's a conspiracy of love in a way. Because it's a way for us to create sustainable models of community that enable people to uh, heal at the deepest levels. And so I'm out of time, but we can talk more about this during the Q&A. So thank you. It is me. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm Jean Noodleman, and I'm from Kaiser Permanente, based here in Northern California. Real quickly, how many of you guys have heard of Kaiser Permanente or? Ah, okay, easy, okay. Because I wasn't sure how, um, if you were throughout the rest of the country. Um, what I'd like to do really quickly is just to follow on with my colleagues here and, and take, go from the concept of health and what creates health to share a little bit about what we're doing. So you may or may not know that Kaiser Permanente's vision and mission is, is simultaneously to provide high quality, quality health care and to improve the health of both our members and the communities that we serve. And this, this image shows our understanding, which is actually reflected from research that has been done in, in the public health world, it's very famous in certain circles, um, of what really creates health. And to build on the work that Dr. Ornish was talking about, actually personal behaviors and environmental and social factors have been shown to have much greater impact on the health of individuals and populations than medical care, which you can see is represented as the smallest gear of only 10%. And if you think about this, it has pretty profound implications for how we use our resources and what we need to do to really support health behaviors. Um, the Institute of Medicine uh, had, did research, and back in 2003, they have a rather famous in public health circles uh, quote, which really talks about that it's not reasonable. People have this perspective that if you just had more will, if you just really thought about it really hard and got the right messages, you would change. And in fact, that paradigm needs to be switched. And it's just not reasonable to expect that people will change their behavior easily when, as you can see, all these other forces really conspire against such change. And so let's go a little bit deeper into the built environment. Um, and you can see that the built environment and it is essential to, to support easy physical activity. And there, this just highlights some of the ways in which the built environment supports our ability, as Karen was saying, to, to incorporate physical activity in our activities, in our daily living, which is what you really need to do. This is an image which you probably have seen that just highlights how we have engineered walking out of many of our communities. And this does represent a particular kind of development in which if you lived or your kid lived in cul-de-sac A and wanted to go over to cul-de-sac B to talk to, to you know, play with their friends, there aren't sidewalks. There is no easy way to go because it's so car oriented. And this is kind of, um, th these developments are in fact becoming less frequent, but they're still pretty ubiquitous, certainly here in California. And then briefly, let's touch on environmental access to healthy foods. And again, if you don't have access, easy access to foods that are affordable and are healthy, all the best intentions and the best knowledge really will make it very difficult for you to change your behaviors. So what have we done? In Kaiser Permanente, I just wanted to touch briefly on what we're doing in our built environment, for our programs, and in our partnerships with our communities. And we, one thing we call it is the total health environment. These show two images, one in Antioch, which is out in East Contra Costa County, and how we've created environments that are both calming and, and beautiful and also encourage walking, and similarly, an outpatient medical center down in San Diego. 
We also now build our master plans, have farmers markets on our facilities, on or near our facilities. And you can find information for where healthy food stores are as well as um, healthy um, tips for cooking. Our designs now and our site plans are explicitly near public transportation for opportunities for bike paths and for walking. And this is a new um, medical center campus in San Leandro, which again is near BART, near retail, and explicitly builds in bike routes. In addition to um, having built environments, something that, that Dr. Ornish talked about is we do think it's important to provide support through programs as well. And we're really focused on walking. And we, we're really, everyone can walk or roll. And we, th there's very, very good data about all the benefits that are associated with walking. And it's not only health, but it is, again, it is um, economic vitality. If you're someplace where it's safe enough to walk, you know it's economically vital. Uh, environmental sustainability, the ability to connect with other human beings. And briefly, we also work with our communities to support their ability to organize. And you can see in the top, that's a street in Santa Rosa, California, where the kids could not walk to school because it really wasn't safe. And they did a lot of work, and they organized, and they were able to bring down federal dollars. And below, <clears throat> excuse me, below you can see it's a completed street now. The kids are able to walk using sidewalks. So you. What I'm trying to convey is that you really have to work on multiple levels and think of the resources that institutions in your communities have in order to make change. Here, I thought you'd like this. Um, the last just talks about, really, we want to encourage moving and thriving whenever possible with our communities. Thanks. Well, hi. While this is getting set up, maybe I'll just start. I'm Jillian Gillette, Director of Transportation Policy for the City and County of San Francisco. And uh, for those of you who are not from San Francisco or not familiar with San Francisco, it's important to remember that where we are now, right now, is next to a really momentous place in San Francisco. Uh, the sort of silver lining of being an earthquake-prone city and having to deal, think uh, proactively about resiliency is that um, we have been able to make some big moves as a result of the, uh, the Loma Prieta earthquake, and one of them is right next to us. It's important to remember that until the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989, you could not see the ferry building uh, right across the street. You couldn't access it between this building and the ferry building was a double-decker freeway that completely disconnected San Francisco from its entire waterfront. So the advent of the Loma Prieta earthquake allowed us to reclaim our waterfront, uh, not just setting us up for the next series of economic cycles, including tourism and, uh, and conventions and things like that, but it has really allowed uh, bicycle paths and walking and the Exploratorium to move onto the waterfront. Uh, so you can do amazing things in certain cities uh, in funny kinds of ways. So is this the clicker? Yeah. So uh, I'm here to talk about how San Francisco designs like it gives a damn. Here's, uh, here's us in a nutshell. Here's current, current city information. We're about 805,000 people. It's a fairly famous city given its actual size. It's an urban, it's the center of, a, of the nine county Bay Area region. Uh, we have, we've increased 30,000 jobs since 2000. Uh, we've added 24,000 units of housing since 2000. Uh, the good news, the sort of good bad problem to have is that all of our transportation systems are at capacity. Um, BART is uh, basically reaching its capacity shy of us adding another tube. Um, the Embarcadero and Montgomery stations are at capacity. Um, Muni is standing room only, that's our local transit agency. Caltrain connects us to San Jose, um, that is also standing room only at capacity. Um, and here's what's going to happen between now and 2040. We have uh, we participated in a metropolitan planning organization-driven planning process that requires us to accept our share of the region's growth. So between now and 2040, it is anticipated that in the Bay Area we will add 2.1 million more people and 1.1 million more jobs. Uh, so we need to plan for 660,000 more housing units. Um, it was decided that 
um, because of our good bones and our transit infrastructure that San, the legacy cities of San Jose, Oakland, and San Francisco should take the lion's share of the growth. So San Francisco is responsible for taking about 15% of the growth. And that means that between now and 2040, we ne need to add 100 and plan for and add 191,000 jobs and 93,000 roughly housing units. So that's a lot. San Francisco historically for the past about 15 years has been building maybe 2,000 units of housing a year in a good year. We need to deliver about 5,000 units of housing to do a year to do this. So being good planners and good urbanists, uh, how are we going to do it? Well, our plans call for putting the, gr the growth in the right place. Uh, growth will happen whether you want it to or not. The key to being smart about all of this is putting it in the right place where it is both locally acceptable but also sustainable. And in San Francisco, we have undertaken multiple planning efforts to put the jobs and housing in the right place. And you can kind of see where it is, all on the eastern side of the city along the Market Street spine, moving into Soma, which was an industrial area. Uh, we decided not to be an active port, and so that li has liberated our industrial lands for both housing and jobs. Uh, and it's important to remember that also Soma surrounds the Caltrain Corridor, which was the historic Southern Pacific Railroad, uh, which is now a commuter rail line. So it's a perfect place to uh, produce transit-oriented development. So that's what we look like in terms of where we're planning for our jobs. Here's where we're planning to put the housing. And the key is, uh, is all about transportation. So here's some things that we're doing quickly, show you some pictures. We're building out our subway. We're reclaiming our public realm. This is a large project on Jefferson Street, massively widening the sidewalks to provide the right facility for the majority of people who are coming there, which is pedestrians and transit users and not vehicles. Here's a smaller example of us widening sidewalks uh, on Powell Street by taking out parking. Um, here's an even smaller example that's driven by neighborhoods, uh, taking, removing parking for outdoor seating. There's even one small parklet removing park, parking in front of uh, a private residence. We're rolling out bicycle share uh, to remove the impediments of bicycle ownership, make it as easy as possible for people to bike. We're studying mirroring our success of removing, uh, having God remove two freeways for us. Uh, we're, now <laughs> we're now studying, actively studying surplus freeway, freeway removal. This is uh, I-280 north of Mariposa. And then uh, finally, this is sort of our call to action, which is sometimes by closing a road, you can open a neighborhood and open minds. So thanks. <laughs>